Welcome back, everybody, to the Who's Your Band podcast. We are joined today, man. We got we got two great guests with us. We have this guy played uh, Flick in A Christmas Story. Plus, he he worked with two comedy legends. He worked with Richard Pryor. He worked with Jackie Gleason on the movie The Toy. We welcome Scott Schwartz, and and an extra bonus. From TMZ, we have comedian, our buddy, Mr. Adam Glenn. What's up, brother? And hey, of course, hey. here's the cherry on top of the cake. Look, look at that well lit, okay? Perfectly rounded. Yes. I, th I, I thought when you were talking about comedy legends that Scott worked with, I was, I was waiting for... Uh... I was waiting for the plug, but I guess you weren't talking about me. So, <laughs> yeah, yeah, you 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 fall like a, a step below. Not yet, a step not yet, below. but you're getting there. <laughs> we're trying, we're trying. Scott, know what I wanted to ask you, um, man, what's what's it like uh, to work in such an iconic movie like A Christmas Story and the scene that you're in? I mean, if people don't remember, I don't know who doesn't. But this is the guy, this is the kid that got his tongue stuck on the flagpole. I mean, what is that like every Christmas? I mean, it, it, it's, 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 explain that. That's got to be amazing. Uh, you know, it's, it's a great feeling to know that I was part of a wonderful, incredible ensemble cast. You know, I mean, my role is really a smaller role in the film, although the scene shines bright and it comes out and it's like one of, normally the top, within the top two to three favorite scenes, that's normally what it is. Um, but it doesn't start out that way. You know, Christmas Story is a small movie nobody wanted to make. It was a labor of love for Bob Clark to do the Gene Shepard thing. And so it was just a gig. It was a six week gig. You know, who knew that it was gonna become what it becomes, you know, and, and the holidays, you know, I mean, everybody celebrates and all that kind of stuff. And, you know, me being the nice Jewish boy that I am, I'm like, all right, what else is on television? You know, I've seen it 500 times, you know. Can I just jump in and say real quick, it's 500 times more than I've seen it because I've never seen the movie. <laughs> it's okay. You're not one of those people, sure. I mean, because uh, was it TBS will run a 24 hour marathon and there yes. are actual nut jobs who I know them who will stay up and watch all 24 hours of a toy, uh, what is it, uh, a Christmas story. See, I know I know the, the pole scene. I know the scene with the little kid with the glasses and the bunny suit. I know the BB gun and I know the lamp and that's it. You, you just missed the Chinese restaurant and you got the whole thing. I mean, the whole movie. <laughs> there you, go. you got the movie. And Adam Glenn, Adam Glenn. I mean, Scott, I don't know if you know Adam. Adam uh, works for, you know, besides being, he's a great stand-up comedian. I was just with him a couple of weeks ago. Um, Adam, uh, how did you get started with uh, TMZ? You know, I graduated in school in 2006 in the middle, right when start started to hit the fan where nobody could get, a job, like at least college graduates were having, like, uh, like many were struggling to get a job and struggling. What was your major? Uh, I majored in communications. I majored in PR, actually. Okay. And uh, I couldn't get a job. I couldn't get an interview. Uh, and I struggled I, for two, for about four years. I struggled finding a real job and went back to school, got my teaching certification, couldn't find the job, couldn't even land an, a job interview. Uh, and I did a show in 2009. Someone in the crowd just said, you seem funny, not threatening, you know, pop culture. Would you be interested in a job at TMZ? I said, listen, I'll do anything for health insurance. And I didn't even know what it was. <laughs> Uh, and they just, they threw a camera in my hand, actually take it back. So I never, I lost contact with the guy who I, well, I sort of stayed in contact, but I didn't hear anything for months. And then, uh, a porn convention was going on in New Jersey at the time. And what I did was I snuck into the porn convention as media and brought a camera with me. And it was not even a good camera. We made like this dumb porn video of me just like interviewing porn celebrities and I, as fake media. And the video kind of got a little bit of attention on YouTube. And I kind of made that video. I sent it back to the guy. He said, this is great. Hold on. Two weeks later, they called me back. They said, hey, you still interested in the job? This is literally on a Friday night. I said, yeah, sure. They're like, all right, you start tomorrow. They gave me a two-week contract. And then after that, they gave me a three-year contract. And then just started staying with them. Yeah. So it's kind of- Good for you. Good for you. 
yeah, yeah. You know, things kind of kind, things kind of blew up for Adam a little bit. Um, he wound up hosting uh, a, a show called I think uh, something Wilshire. Yeah, I, I, so I had a really good experience while doing the job. You know, I got to meet pretty much every single celebrity I always wanted to meet. Uh, uh, Beyonce put me in a music video, and then got to sing with a bunch of celebrities on the street, and then uh, that led to me hosting my own game show called South of Wilshire. Uh, thanks That's for right. watching, guys. And uh, no, no, it is. Uh, I watched uh, it. I watched it, and I helped plug it for you. Did, you did reach out. I do appreciate that. And it was we did sixty-eight episodes. I lived in LA for a while and got to film this game show, and it was cool to be a game show host and be a producer on a Fox syndication talk show, a game show. So it was cool. It was a good experience. That is really cool, man. Um, speaking of cool, um, uh, Scott, can can you do you do you remember? I mean, because it's such a long time ago. But what was did you un, did you understand how great it was to work with Richard Pryor and, and Jackie Gleason? Just just two unbelievably iconic Mount Rushmore type uh, comedic geniuses. What was that experience like? And did you stay in touch with these guys afterwards? They 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 were great, but there were mitigating circumstances to why our our you know uh, friendships lasted. You know, I I was a film buff. I was a movie guy. I know Richard from Silver Streak, you know, and uh, Bingo Long and uh, Stir Crazy. So I was a fan, you know, and my father never had a problem with language. I didn't grow up in a house, you know, you can't say this word or that word. They didn't care about that. And Gleason, I was a Smokey and the Bandit junkie. I loved the Honeymooners. I did impressions of both of them. So when I started the film, they they saw the love that I had for them as as entertainers. How old were you when you did the toy? Uh, I had my 14th birthday while we were shooting. Okay. So I, I remember all of it. You know, I was old enough to know and, and remember everything. So, I mean, they made it a great experience and our friendships lasted, you know, as long as they were both here. I saw Gleason uh, about a year before he passed. And uh, I was friends with Richard the whole way, you know, and uh, even when, when the MS was not good and he was, you know, laying in bed and all that. And uh, I still went to see him and it was basically a one-way conversation because he couldn't talk to me anymore, you know, but yeah, it, they gave me incredible amounts of information and, and the education I got from them. I mean, I was a wacko. That's the only way I can explain it. I was just a wacky guy. So I had fun with, you know, between Ray Stark, Richard Donner, Ned Beatty, you know, Richard, Jackie, or Mr. Gleason. I still always call him. He's not here, but I still call him Mr. Gleason. Uh, they gave me incredible amount of, of education on that set. I got four years of college in four months. Was... Was Pryor funny on the set? Did he did he crack jokes? Like like you hear stories of Rickles like on the set of Casino and how balls and and going after uh, De Niro um, was Richard was Pryor funny. Richard was not what you think. He was quiet. He was studious. He sat in his chair. He read books. He underlined things. He highlighted things. He was constantly a man looking for more knowledge. You know. Now, if you wound up the wind up toy, he goes. And that's what Richard did. Once you got him started, then it was all over the place. You know, him telling me about women was a great education, you know, because mm. there was no filter. The man had no filter. I heard stuff at 13 and 14 years old on a set today. That guy's in jail. <laughs> you know, Gleason, Gleason told me stories, but he smoked right next to me. You know, you can't do that now. You know, this is a this is just a, a, a sort of a different world we live in. You know, but they were both just phenomenal. Can you remember something that um, that Pryor may have said that was was, was kind of? I mean, we the three of us. We're all stand up comedians, okay? So, I mean, I think when you talk about Richard Pryor, I think almost to a man, everyone kind of agrees he is in the top uh, four comedians. Oh, he's on the Mount Pryor. Rushmore. There's, there's no question. Exactly. He's the Godfather. He's the Godfather. You know, all of the guys today, they all say the same thing. Oh, my God, you work with the Godfather. You right. Know. It's Colin, 
and prior, and then you can argue the other two. But the, the those two, I think, are indisputable. But what was something funny? And, and Sean Morton, of course. Right. Okay, you know he is going to be at Bananas uh, in in a, in a couple of weeks. Yes. So uh, you know, Richard. Has that Richard. Richard said to me, anybody can tell a joke. Anybody can tell a joke. If you become a storyteller, people will follow the story. And when they get to the payoff, to the to the punchline or the bonus or whatever it is at the end, they're going to love it that much more because they, they got engrossed in what you were telling them. You know, I mean, uh, it happened later. I was working at the comedy store. I worked there from... Uh, uh, late 87 to uh, 89. Were you a comedian? Were you a stand-up? I did stand-up. I did a little bit of stand-up. You know, Adam, have that. you ever met Mitzi? I have, yeah. Oh, actually, no, I never met Mitzi. I never, never I was there during the Mitzi era, but I never got to meet Mitzi. She was just, I've been in, I've been in the room when there was phone calls with her, so I would hear her iconic voice, but I never oh. got to meet Mitzi. Oh, Adam, you're fun. You can do <laughs> Tuesdays and Thursdays. Oh, you're <laughs> wonderful. Um, so, I mean, I got to spend a year and a half there. Well, I'm working the main room one night and Richard was coming in and I knew that. So I told the waitress, just tell me when, you know, he comes in, whatever. So he came in, she tells me, I go in the back and I'm in the, in the little green room behind the main room stage. And it's Robin Williams, Sam Kinison, Richard, and his wife, Jennifer and me. Christ. And we talked for a few minutes, whatever. Well, now it's time for Richard to go on. So if you've been back there, it's basically when you come out the door, it's a long alleyway. If you go to the end and you make a left, you go out to the showroom. But if you walk right out and you make a quick left, you're at the back of the main room stage by the curtain. So I'm the doorman. That's what I did. I seated everybody. Okay, fine. So I'm holding the door. Robin walks out, makes a left. Sam walks out, makes a left. Jennifer walked out, goes straight ahead. Richard looks at me and he goes, well, what are you going to do? I said, I'm working. He says, no, nah, not right now. You're not working. Come on. So he grabs my arm and pulls me through the, the, the stage, back through the curtain. So he and I sat on the back of the stage. Sam and Robin did 20 minutes. This is the main room stage on a Monday night. Open mic, you know, Monday nights. But they were scheduled. So they do like 20, 25 minutes. Sam turns around, hands Richard the mic. Richard gets up. Now Sam and I are sitting there at the back of the stage. And they do 20, 25 minutes. Well, you know, Robin turns around. He hands me the mic. And I looked at him and I said, and what do you want me to do? <laughs> he goes, that's your boy. Go get him. I'm like, you're serious? He goes, go get him. Okay. So he hands me the mic. So I walked up and Richard's talking to the, to the audience. And he turns and he sees me standing. He goes, oh, you want some of this? I just kind of went like, I shrugged my shoulders. I didn't even say anything. Well, he tore into me like you can't believe. I mean, he's telling every small dick joke you can possibly imagine, you know, telling how he sent girls to my trailer and booby time and all this stuff. Mm -hmm. I didn't say a word. And he did it for like three, four minutes. And I just stood there. And finally, when he got out of breath, he looks at me and he goes, you got nothing to say? I said, I was waiting for you to shut the fuck up. Now I can actually say something. <laughs> well, then it was on. Now I'm, I'm just going at him, telling the audience he's banging every PA on the set, and this one and that one and this. And we ended up doing about 25 minutes. I mean, maybe the greatest experience of my life was being on that stage with those three guys. You know, we got done and Sam was like, that was great. Robin gave me a kiss on the cheek and he said, you did great. You know, and, and Richard, he was like, it's true. You're the white son I never had. Was Robin Robin was a star at this point? Oh sure, this is late eighties. This is okay, eighty eight. Okay. All right. So were they partying oh, yeah. at that time? Were they dabbling? Oh, Sam, Sam and Robin were. Richard wasn't at the time. I mean, I I have found out other things that he did do. There were times when he slipped back into some of the drugs. Never did it around me ever, ever. I mean, I can tell you, he always had a drink in his hand, but. I never saw him do one drug of any kind, hmm. you know, but there, there have been many, many stories about, you know, he slipped and he went back and he did this, you know, I spent time at his home, you know, I mean, I was, I had open door policy, you know, when, when he was getting sick, you know, he told uh, the, the nurse and, and his wife, he said, listen, there may come a time when I can't talk, 
But if Scotty shows up at two o'clock in the morning and wants to go outside to the jacuzzi with a broad, he wants to get laid, somebody better open the door for him. Scott, what do you think was that bond? What do you think it was that that thing that brought you in? I mean, you guys seem like two completely different type of guys. What was Completely the bond opposite. That you guys together? Um, personality, um, that I think had a lot to do with it. You know, me just being open to him. You know, there were no uh walls of any kind between us he knew everything that i was up to i knew most of the stuff that he did other than the drugs and the stuff that i wasn't privy to um but we talked about movies we talked about television we talked about life you know i mean the stuff you know again you know it, richard was colorless that's how i put it you know especially in today's era with so much white black this that you know i grew up in central jersey you know, I mean, I had close friends. They're still my friends that are of color, but that that's not what I see. I see Eric Murdoch. He played in the NBA. He was a first round draft pick. If not for me, he wouldn't have gotten through high school because he cheated off me every other day. Where did you, you grow know? up? Did you grow up in LA? No, I grew up in central New Jersey, a town called Bridgewater, New Jersey, about, about an hour from the city or so. Well, exactly where it is. I played hockey there. <laughs> yeah. Um, and Adam, but, you're a Jersey guy too, aren't you? I'm a Jersey. I live in New York now, but I'm a Jersey guy. Where? Uh, Union. Very Union. Nice. Next yeah, stop, but... Union. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. I'm right near Elizabeth. Beautiful, beautiful around this time of year now. But uh, uh, no, I'm a Jersey guy. I'm, I'm total Jersey. I'm a Jersey Shore guy during the summer. I'm in the city now, but I'm I'm, I'm I myself Jersey. I refuse to change my license. There you go. Smart move. Seaside. Yeah. Got to go to Seaside. Not anymore. Not anymore. Seaside's anymore. a dump. Seaside's a dump. I had, I had a, I yeah, had. You haven't been here, here so. for a couple summers. Yeah, I, I loved, San, I Hurricane loved Sandy it. hit, and they were just like, eh, all right, we'll build up the next town instead. Oh, Adam, you, you mentioned um, you got into a Beyonce video. How, how did that come about? How did you, was it from interviewing her, and did you? So did you see her? I got to meet. I got to see her a bunch of times. I actually never got to really interact with her, but I kind of put my camera on her and do the the journalism paparazzi stuff on her. And I had a tip that she was doing a music video in Coney Island uh, on a summer day one day. We all, so me and a few photographers there, cause we had a tip that she was filming something there, but we didn't know what she was exactly filming. And it, we didn't even know she was working on- How do you get these, music. how do you get these tips? How do you get these leads? Usually people like publicists will kind of like pass notes and kind of hit you up and say, hey, listen, we got like a lead, like something's going on. Uh, and I, I and that's roughly kind of what happened this time. All the paparazzi we kind of work together and some, to some extent, uh, me more than others because I do video. I'm not photography, so I'm not competition to them. Um, and so people paparazzi more wanted to help me and work with me rather than work against me. So it I also helps that, that you are a, you know Scott. You you don't you don't know Adam. He is easily one of the nicest people you're going to meet in any <laughs> profession. He's a great like, guy. I so a Jersey wonderful. guy, of course. Yeah, exactly. What is a Jersey guy too, but no one I'm a miserable it. prick, so I really can't say that. <laughs> so I get to step that Beyonce's filming a music video, and I go there. It's a Coney Island. I've, I haven't been to Coney Island in years. It's just a normal summer day. I'm walking around. We can't figure out what's going on. There's no leads. There's no crew. Like We're like, what is going on here? We're just walking around. So I'm waiting there for like two and a half hours. I'm like, fuck this. I'm about to leave, right? And I start to leave, and my buddy's like, dude, you should come. I think something's bad to happen. We pull in. I run back to the Cyclone roller coaster. Next thing you know, like a few vans pull up. Beyonce shows up with a gorilla type crew and starts walking around Coney Island just filming. And you can tell it's like, you know, she's got their security with her. She's got like this, her, her team with her. And it's a lot of people, but not a lot of people. But all of a sudden, as soon as Beyonce shows up, you're talking about thousands of people start surrounding her. I didn't get close to her a few times and I can't really get her attention. So I'm like, you know what? Screw this. I get my few shots of her, like going on the roller coaster. I'm like, screw this. And my buddy's like, dude, she's about to go on. Let's, she's about to go on the beach. Let's get in front of her and get like one good shot of her. Give it one good try. And then we'll just get out of here. I'm like, all right, cool. She gets on the beach. I get right in front of her. And I'm like, what up B? And she goes, Oh, what up? And she goes, I'm like, B, this is crazy. And she's like, yeah, this is nuts. And again, I don't really know her. I just started like, you know who her. you are or no, I, I she might've knew my face. But obviously, I'm holding my video camera, like I'm filming her a little bit, but I'm acting like kind of fun. And they're just kind of filming her kind of walking around Coney Island. It's not like a music video production. It's very guerrilla style again. 
And I go, man, this is nuts. She goes, this is crazy. And I go, yo, B, you want me to do a cameo? And I call her B, like I'm friends with her. Um, <laughs> and uh, I go, hey, B, you want me to do a cameo? She goes, come on, come do a cameo. And she pulls me into the video. And I start like moving around with her for a little bit. And next thing you know, you see me with her for a second. It's a fun part of it because it's this big director's directing this guy, Terry Richardson. Some security guy thinks I just jumped in the video, grabs me and like throws me into the sand. I'm like in the sand, like, like pummeling in the sand. And they're like, no, 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 he's cool. He's cool. So then I get back up and then they realize like they sort of needed me because like I just helped kind of create a space for her to walk around because I was there. So no one kind of jumped in front of me. And then, then they knew, like, hey, she was cool with him. He was cool with her. He wasn't bothering us. He obviously knew we were shooting something, but he wasn't getting in the way. So they let me tag along. And the security was so focused on keeping her safe that I kind of got to go up there and say, hey, Beyonce, I just want to say thank you so much. That was really cool. I didn't mean to be. And she's like, no, thank you. That was so sweet, so fun. That was great. Four months later, we never knew anything what she was doing. I didn't know, what, never knew what she did. Four months later, it's a Friday afternoon. And all of a sudden, I get a call at three in the morning. Hey, Adam, you're in a Beyonce video. I'm like, uh, yeah, yeah. We shot that thing like three months, like four months. I don't, I didn't think anything of it. Next thing you know, I wake up at 7 a.m., 7.15 in the morning to about hundreds of text messages. It's all over Good Morning America. It's all over today's show. Beyonce drops an album with all these music videos. Just surprise album with all these music what videos. What was the song? Uh, the song was called XO. And it's actually a great song too. And I'm like, holy shit, I'm on the Today Show. I'm like, Good Morning America. It's like going crazy. And I'm like, you got to, like, you got to, you got to come in. You got to come into the office at, at the time I was at TMZ. So I start driving through Times Square. As I'm driving through Times Square, my face is on the big screen because they're showing it like as the news story. Like, oh my God, Beyonce <laughs> drops a new album. And then my face is like part of like the, the press release for this new vi video. And it's like, you know, it's part of history right now. Like Courtney Cox was in like a Bruce Springsteen video. So this was like my it's, Courtney it's Cox what moment. Propelled her. It yeah. really is what propelled her career. Yeah, so this was like my Courtney Cox moment. So it was really surreal and very cool. And uh, I got to like see her like another time and be like, hey, that was so cool. You know, like it's just cool to be part of history. And also, I mean, one of the biggest artists of all time being one of her music videos and have like a, not like a big role by any means, but like a very like, hey, that's Adam in there. You know, it's just a cool shot. You know, I, I do kind of, uh, <laughs> Sean, Sean's going to blow his brains out after this. But I do kind of um, relate to what you're talking about because when they started releasing clips for the Irishman, okay, and it, it, they started, he, uh, they did an, uh, an interview on CBS Morning Show, and my scenes made those clips and they made the trailer. And I wake up and I got tons of of texts and and messages like, "Hey, I just saw you on on CBS Morning Show and on the kiosk, uh, you know, in." Um, at Rockefeller Center, and it's like you know, I, I I didn't I don't watch the CBS Morning Show, right? It's like that that that, that little quick shots, man. You know, go, when it goes national, it's amazing how many people see it, right? It's just cool, man. It's just it's very you know, it's uh, it's just gratifying. You know, as a comic, we're in, you know we're such we're used to quick gratification. If it's a joke is funny, boom, you get a laugh right there. And when you do TV, when you do stuff like this. It takes a while and you it's sort of like you throw a grenade and you're waiting to hear how people react. And then it's just cool. I mean, it was just very surreal, very cool. And it was just a whole cool experience that I, I just kind of just right place, right time. And just kind of, it just happened. And really ever since that, it really helped me out with a lot of other celebrities where, you know, I remember running to Deion Sanders and him not doing interviews. He's like, no, no, my boy over there, he was in a Beyonce video. I'm talking to him. And then, uh, and you got street really cred happened. now. It, it, what's up? You got street cred now. I do, but that's what <laughs> happens. You know, ever since she, you know, as soon as she puts me in music videos, like, you know what, I should talk to him. Like, he's not just your normal guy. Like, he's in the game. And that's helped kind of uh, give me a little bit more of a position in the industry and kind of get me, led to me getting bigger and more interviews. It's kind of like, it's kind of like when I was on season seven of Last Comic Standing, but I didn't make the, I made the audition stage. And I didn't get any further, but they pulled me out of the line and asked me to be on the intro. Oh, walking yeah, down, the street, walking like down the street with Craig Robinson. Oh, you were Craig yeah. Robinson? Is that he was hosting then? That was he was hosting. So like, you know, and I put screen caps on and stuff like that. Like, hey, look, I made the intro. And then for like nine, no, basically about seven years after that. Hey, coming to the stage, your next comic, he's been on last comic standing. And I'm like, oh, Jesus Christ. No, I have not. <laughs> I was on for four seconds on the intro of the first episode of season seven, for Christ's sake. 
That's every comic's credit, though. None of these comics, <laughs> and me including, don't have real credits. We just say, uh, you know, this next comic watched Comedy Central. Give it up for, you know? <laughs> Well, Jeff was in The Irishman. I don't know if you know that. So he, yeah, he, I, I, he, no, it, never, it never comes up on this show. Uh, <laughs> oh, God, I'm going to fucking kill him. You know, speaking of, like, iconic women performers, okay, you, you, Adam, you had um, Beyonce, but Scott, Scott, did you, didn't you do a movie with uh, Liza Minnelli? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah uh, uh, A Time uh, to Live, right? Yeah, it was an NBC uh, movie of the week. Uh, Liza was, was my mom. Jeff DeMunn was my dad. Corey Haim is my brother and me. How, Susie, how was Liza? Susie Kurtz was in it. How was oh, Liza? Love us, Susie Kurtz. Yeah. Yeah. No. Uh, you know, most of the days she was okay. She had one or two not so great days, but there were all kinds of things going on away from the set. But uh, sweet lady, you know. Uh, you know, again, personalities. You know, uh, I do a lot of stuff with memorabilia, so I, I actually had found a photo of her as a baby. She was like one years old in her mom's arms. And I gave wow. it to her. And she's like, I've wow. never seen this. You know, I Did saw her about a year. No, I gave it to her. Oh, you gave it to her. Um, no, I went to ask, was she, man, I mean, Liza is an, I, as iconic as it gets. I mean, this is the daughter of, of Judy Gollin, you know? Uh, it, it, it's like, was she, was she, did she have like diva behavior on the set or was she kind of cool and accessible? What was it like working with her though? She I mean, was probably the, sounds amazing. She was for the most part, very accessible, you know, to the point where even after, you know, a year later, she was playing uh, out on Long Island and I went out, I, I called her agent. I got the number. I called, I said, Hey, this is who I am. I want to come see the show. What do you want? Liza says, whatever you want is great. She can't wait to see you. And did the show, you know, went to the show and it ended up, it, it was an outdoor show and it rained and she did uh, an hour and 45 minutes in the rain. And then after the show, we went back and saw her and got kisses and hugs and all that, you know, and took pictures with my mom and my friend. And no, I mean, you know, uh, I've been very, very lucky that most of the people that I've worked with have been really cool people, you know, there hasn't been really too many shitheads that I've worked with. I've met a couple of shitheads. But uh, who, I haven't really who, worked with too many shitheads. Who was a shithead? Kenny Rogers. Really? Oh, fuck him. He's dead. Who cares? He was, he was an ass. You know why? If, if I because I didn't have a, a, a blonde and big tits. You know. Ah, uh, he was one of those type of guys. One like of those Derek type Judah? of guys. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Adam, you ever come across guys like that? Some assholes, sure. Um, you know, uh, I always say Ryan Reynolds is really disappointing. Um, and I think actually affected his career because there's, a, you know, I think when you meet Ryan Reynolds, you know, his first movie, you wanted him to be Van Wilder wasn't the greatest movie, but it was a great character. Like it was just one of those movies you watch it for the character. He was like, he was like that character he always wanted to be. He was kind of like a Mahoney for Police Academy, like you just want to be him. And think about Ryan Reynolds. I think afterwards he played a few movies like he was Van Wilder, like he was Ryan Reynolds, and then he just kind of became like a dick. And you know, I think a lot of people just kind of he rubbed people the wrong way. And he stopped doing movies for a little bit, at least good movies, until he kind of recreated Deadpool and kind of recreated that kind of sarcastic, kind of charming type guy again. And they started getting roles again. And I've met him a few times on the street and he just really wasn't the warmest guy. You could tell he was performing when like, like he's doing interviews, he was performing, but the, the, the guy he really was, was not the guy he's seen too big. Mm. You know, I mean, I, I've, I, I've always said that most people are pretty decent. You approach them in the right way. You know, if then they if then they're just an asshole, then they're just an asshole. That's just what they are. You know, everybody yeah. has good days. I've met a lot of, of, of athletes and they they have their good days and they have their bad days. You know, actors are the same way. Pretty much everybody is the same way. You know, I try and give everybody more than one shot if I meet them a second time or whatever. I mean, Kenny, I just I met him and, you know, he was in Vegas at a, at a video software show and he's walking around. And I said, you know, Mr. Rogers, I'm a fan. Actually, while I was doing A Time to Live with Liza Minnelli, Kenny played in Montreal. And I bought a ticket and went to the show. So I told him I'm a fan, you know, the, yeah, whatever. I said, listen, I, I, would, I would just love to get a picture. I'm not doing any pictures today. And Adam, you're going to like this. He turned around when he left me. He went to the back area of the video show, which was the adult section where all the adult stars were, and took pictures with everybody. 
I believe that. You know, he but he wouldn't terrible. take a picture I, with me. I saw him maybe a few years ago, and he didn't look so great. Well, obviously, look what happened to him. Yeah, but I'm talking, but I'm talking mid '90s. This is yeah. you know, so long ago. It's not like he was an old man in a wheelchair. You know, he's walking around. You know, Adam. I anybody was, ever take a swing at you? Uh, me? No, Adam. Like I, when you're when I you're never, doing your thing. So I never got to any. I actually, I take that back. I got to a few physical stuff. Um, but it mostly wasn't with the celebrity. Actually, it really wasn't with the celebrity doll. It's usually the people around them. And I, I'll say this. I'll get into the swinging, but. If the people around them are cool, the publicist, the team, the manager, if they're cool, that usually the celebrity is cool. If they're sort of uptight, the assistants are uptight and kind of very like hands on, it's because the celebrity is very difficult. Um, I myself have the only few times I got into physical altercation was maybe like three times, but twice I could really remember. First time was actually my first like month of worry. I remember going for Gary Coleman. So it's, this was this one was my fault, it, but it was also because I was so green to what was going on. I didn't know what was going on. Um, it was Gary Coleman's parents' manager, and this is right after Gary Coleman passed away. And everyone wanted to get a shot at Gary Coleman's parents, and I didn't know the right way. I didn't know what I was doing. You know, I, again, they just threw a camera in my hand. I didn't know what I was doing, but I was so scared of losing my job, and I was told I have to get this shot. I have to get the shot. And I went up to, I knew where he was staying. I had a tip where he was staying. The parents came out with a lawyer out of the hotel they were staying in Manhattan. And I put this camera in their, you know, up and I start to ask some questions. And it's, you know, it, looking back, it wasn't the best thing to do. Listen, their kid just, their son just passed away. I, I, I don't think I did the right thing. And uh, that's my fault, but I didn't know what I was doing. I was young and also I was afraid of losing my job, this opportunity I had, because I struggled for so long. I started asking questions. They're like, hey, not now. And I started kept asking the questions, not now. Then I kept saying one more question and the manager like came up and like scratched my face and my neck. And I had like a little bit of blood on my face and my neck. The guy was a little guy. I wasn't going to fight back. I mean, I wasn't going to do anything. The second, actually, then I had, which we'll get to musicians. Um, this one time was, an, uh, a, this one actually was an interesting time. Um, Rihanna and Drake were dating. And they were eating at Nobu 57 on 57th Street. And Nobu 57, Nobu is one of the nicest restaurants in Manhattan. That's Rihanna, the Nero's place. Inside, and it's weird where the restaurant is because where, where, where the restaurant is, it's like a little bit of an alley. And they could go out on 57th Street side or they could go out on the 56th Street side. They could walk down the alley and go out to 50, 56th Street side. So me and a few paparazzi are waiting outside for Rihanna to come out, get the shot. Kind of laying back too. We're like, that's an easy shot. She has to walk out, walk to the car. We're kind of set up, hanging out, being calm. Next thing you know, Drake's bodyguards or his friends, not his bodyguards, his friends come out and stand in front of us like a wall. And we're like, what the fuck is going on? And next thing you know, Rihanna and Drake come out and they start walking the opposite side of where we are. And they had like this whole thing. We're going to block them so they can't run on the other side of us and walk to the car so they can get the shot. So they kind of block us. They made this wall so we can't run around them and get the shot. Rihanna and Drake start going, walking towards the other side. And we're like, what the fuck? And these guys make a wall in front of us. So then two paparazzi are like, screw it. We're going to run around them. And these guys are fast. They just take off and start running around it. So then next thing you know, it's like, all right, everyone run. And became like a scramble. Like it was a football play. And everyone starts running around these guys. They're chasing after like a man. You know, they don't know who to run after. We're all running after people. And I'm in pretty decent shape. I run up. I get right up to Rihanna and Drake. And I have the camera on them. Then boom, I get punched in the head. And um, I get punched in the head, but I didn't go down. And it was from one of Drake's closest friends punched me in the head. And I said, dude, that's all you got? I said, that's all you got? I said, I wasn't even ready for this. You like totally <laughs> slipped me and I didn't go to the ground. That's all you got? And they're scared shitless at this point because it's assault, number one. And you fuck with the media. So next thing you know, they're scared shitless. They jump in the car. I wasn't hurt at all. Um, I was like kind of like laughing. I kind of like laughed it off. And the car takes off, the paparazzi start chasing them, and they're also scared shitless, like, oh, my God, we just got into a fight with the paparazzi, this has become a news story, they're also going to sue us, blah, blah, blah. Next day, I wake up, I get a call from a person in the label saying, hey, I heard you were there, I heard you're part of the incident, I apologize, and then they sent me, like, a ton of, like, these cupcakes and stuff like that as an apology. Oh, and that's just so wonderful. It was so great. Listen, <laughs> you know what, I could have, it's not even worth suing, because you know, it becomes public information. I didn't need my name in the press for something like this, that I was in a fight or an altercation. I wasn't hurt. I just didn't give a shit really. I was like, all right, thanks for the cupcakes. It was what it was. It's a funny story. So that was that. And then <laughs> this actually goes into the podcast. Um, 
the guy from the Who, uh, the little guy, not the big, not Pete Townsend. Um, Roger Daltrey. Roger, Roger, Roger Daltrey. Roger okay. Daltrey is waiting outside the Essex Hotel for a car, and I'm training. He's a, a strong new guy. guy. And yeah, small guy. He's waiting. And I'm like, oh, we walk right by. I'm like, oh shit, that's Roger Daltrey. And I, uh, I'm training a new guy. I go, dude, go film Roger Daltrey. The guy walks up to Roger Daltrey. Goes, hey, Mr. Daltrey, how you doing, sir? And he puts his camera up to him. Daltrey looks at him and then just goes into the hotel, walks into the hotel, and then he's like, that was it. That was a shot. So the guy puts his camera down, starts walking towards me. He's like, ah, shit sucked. Next thing you know, Daltrey comes running out, throws him against the wall, goes. Are you fucking stupid? Do you, you know, I'll beat the shit out of you, blah, blah, blah. So then I run up to protect the guy. I go, listen, dude. And I kind of pushed him against the wall. I go, listen, dude, I don't know who you are. I don't know where you're from, but leave him alone. Get a life, dude. Walk on, grow up, you know? And I start telling him. Oh, Roger Daltrey to get a life. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but I was just like. The guy, pretty, the guy played Woodstock. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. And uh, I was like, dude, get, I don't know who the fuck you are. I don't know where you get it. Go the fuck away. Walk away, dude. And like, it just kind of put him in his place. And then he kind of just walked, kind of went back and kind of separated the two. Um, so, it, you know, but it's, I mean, it, I was, to be honest with you, 90% of the people are awesome. 5% aren't into it, which I respect. The other 5% are assholes. And you did something nice for you. Like, well, I'll you tell you what, anyone... Leslie, the bigger the celebrity, the cooler they are. I agree with that. I've 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 met uh, and worked with 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 a ton of, uh, of of big names as well. You know, I worked with the Stones and Springsteen. They, they they were just wonderful. But who did something went out of the way? Who who is there like a good story where something really like like nice happened for you? Yeah, dude, uh, Shaquille O'Neal. Shaquille O'Neal, I the um, best, dude. He's the best, bro. I have you know in the other room. Actually, um, I don't feel like getting that, but I have. I have a, I have one of his original his first ever sneaker size twenty two autographed to me like it's the cool he's the best. Um, Shaq is one of those guys. My strategy was for every single time a celebrity comes to New York, I want them to know who I am. I want to cross paths with a celebrity every time they come to New York, and just because I want them to get to know me a little bit. You know, I want I want to be like the naked cowboy for celebrities. I wanted them to be part of their New York experience, and Shaq was one of them. And every time Shaq came to New York for years, I made sure I crossed paths with him. And one day I saw him come out of a hotel and he goes, hey, buddy, not now. I'm just not into it today. I go, all right, no worries. Put the camera down. He goes, yo, what's your number? And I go, here's my number. And I was like, all right. Next thing you know, I get a text from him. And, I, and he starts sending me like funny photos. So I was like, all right, Wait, did cool. You, so I, did you really believe it was him? Oh, it, it was him. It was him. He texted me right away. And he was wow. sending me funny stuff. And then I would text him funny stuff. And we kept in touch, you know. And then all of a sudden, one day I get a call from Shaq. And he goes, yo, where are you? And I go, uh. I'm uh, at Midtown. He goes, get downtown right now. You're coming with me. I'm like, all right. So I raced downtown. It was like 8.30 in the morning. He goes, yo, I'm kidnapping you for the day. And he threw me in the car with him. And he brought me with him to all his press stops. I went to like The View. I went to like uh, uh, all these TV shows with him. I went to uh, Mary Vieira, like all these other talk shows with him. And he just wanted me by him by his side the entire day. And we made this video. It became super funny. We had a great experience. And uh, he loved it. And ever since, like he – you know, everyone knows me as Shaq's guy. So whenever he comes to New York, I'm part of his sort of team where I ride with him whenever he does his press stuff and just kind of help him out and just kind of, we're just buds. And I protect him. He protects me. But because he threw me like, as, as because he made me part of his team, um, a lot of people started to accept me. A lot of celebrities be like, Hey man, that's Shaq's guy. And I could call him if I need a favor. And he's just been a really close friend for advice, but also just kind of, good to know and it's just it's a genuine friendship same thing on maybe david spade is a great guy um he's a good guy who i just met on the street we became friends and then also uh uh the fellow you know, when I need advice and just kind of go to him but also i try to help him out when i can and you know i don't ask him for anything it's more just kind of, well, besides advice but it's just kind of like we just enjoy each other's company he loves hearing my stories and i love hearing his stories and it's just it's fun you must look like a fucking sandwich standing next to the shack Dude, it's the oddest thing. Like people are like, you guys should do like a buddy cop film. It's just so ridiculous. <laughs> how, how tall are you, Adam? I'm five eleven. Okay, I'm five eleven. Here's want to hear a great story. So I go. I'm with Shaq is doing Seth Meyers. Yeah, it is a great story. Shaq's doing Seth Meyers, and we walk. He go. I, I have to take a piss. Says, All right, I'll go to the bathroom with you. And I go to the bathroom with him. And I notice when Shaq has to pee, take a piss, it's, we're in the bathroom alone, just me and him. He goes to the stall. I go to the urinal. And I'm like, all right. Like, I thought you had a piss. Like, why well, just go to the, just piss in the, and he goes, oh, you don't, we come out. He goes, you don't understand. I have to piss in the urinal. 
I, I have to piss in the stall. I go, why do you have to piss in the stall? He goes, everyone tries to take a look when I go to the urinal. No, that's that's true. I, the one time I met Shaq was backstage at, it was one, I don't know if it was the, the TJ Martell Foundation dinner. It was one of these things. He was there and we both went to the bathroom at the same time and I was going to take a, a look. That, well, that, you, you were going to take a look. There was a little <laughs> hole in the side of the door in the stall. Yes. Scott, did, do you have a, a Shaq story? Did do you, I did have you, a Shaq story? Yes. Did you meet Shaq? Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. I put my camera up there. That's funny because he said that. And that's why I asked how tall he was. Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so I did a commercial in 1980 with Julia Serving, Dr. J. Yeah. Well, he became, of course, the president of the Orlando Magic, and they drafted this guy named Shaquille O'Neal. So I went out there. I called Doc, and I said, hey, I want to meet the kid. He's like, no problem. So I go out, and I meet Shaquille. Big Richard Pryor fan. Know the toy. Big fan. Okay, great. And I said, well, you want to talk to him? He's like, oh, my God. Yeah. So I had the old cell phone with the big tower, you know, the big block phone. And I called Richard in California and I said, uh, hey, I said, I'm here with uh, the kid from the Orlando Magic, Shaq. He's like, really? I said, yeah, he wants to talk to you. So I put Richard on the phone with Shaquille O'Neal. Wow. And that we're talking, this is his rookie season, you know. Yeah, this had to be one. And, and, and Shaq and I have hung out. I mean, Adam, if you talk to him. You mention my name, he's going to go, oh, that's my boy. <laughs> I mean, you know, I've known him a long time. Great guy, you know. The best. He's. I, he, I got to say one thing, but he's, Shaq is like, he's a good person. Like he, mm -hmm. like he, he walks into a room and, I, and he, when he walks into a room, obviously he's so, he stands out, you know, he's very recognizable. And he walks into a room, he shakes everyone's hand. He's seven feet. I, well, he's a monster. Obviously, he he's like Hulk Hogan, the most recognizable people, in my opinion, just about. Absolutely. And when he walks into a room, he shakes everyone's hand. I go, why are you shaking everyone's hand? He goes, you don't understand. If I shake someone's hand, I made their day. Not only did I make their day, they become a fan for life. Not only that, they're going to tell three people today, know who I met Shaq, and he was the nicest guy. All you have to, and he said it takes more energy to be a bad guy than a good guy. He's like, he's just a good person. It's like genuine, too. It's just... Oh, Hogan, both of them, they're the same. They're, they have the same makeup. You know, Hogan is like that. I've known Hulk since 85. And uh, it was about maybe 10, 12 years ago now, something like that. Uh, he was out here in L.A. And he was not that far from where I live and my folks live. He was at the grocery store. My mom runs into him. Now, Hulk is, you know, damn near seven feet. My mom is four ten and a half. And my mom walks up to Hulk and goes, I know who you are. And he goes, you do? He goes, you're Hulk Hogan. He says, uh-huh. She's like, you know my son. And, and, and Terry's like, I do? He's like, yeah, Scotty Schwartz. And he goes, oh, my God, of course. And she bends down, gives my mom a hug and a kiss on the cheek and talk to my mom. And it's the same mindset. It's very easy to be kind. It's very hard to be an asshole. And that's the mentality that both of them have. I've played bad guy for both of them. You know, it's great because people don't recognize me. And I'm the one like, dude, you're great at this. I said, I don't mind being the asshole. It's okay. Because they don't want to be that person. Scott, what are you doing now? I mean, you you had a really super interesting life, you know, you know between the acting and the people you, you know and the people you've worked with. And I know you you did something like I think behind the scenes in the uh, adult film industry, but you also kind of uh, collect a lot as well. And I I think I remember you as a See my writer. Walls? Yes, you 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 wrote for uh, one of the publications, Beckett. Yeah, that's one of my favorite shots right there. Oh Jesus Christ, that is iconic. You know, but then it's not like I'm here and there's Muhammad and there's Wayne Newton and Kurt Russell, Leslie Nielsen. Uh, Roy Rogers is up there. This guy, none of you guys would know. This guy here, his name was Davy Sharp. He was a, a stunt man. Uh, he taught the guy Terry Leonard, who did all uh, all the stuff in Raiders of the Lost Ark of going under the cars, doing the all under the stunt man work. So he's the one who taught him. And you know, there's me and there's a there's a, there's a picture from a few days ago, me and John. John you know, um, yeah. I mean, I I. I did the line of uh, trading cards for Donruss called Americana. That was my baby. I created that with them. 
You know, I right. said, how many like Dan Marinos like and Brett Favre right. autographs do you need? How about doing some celebrities? And it kind of opened up this whole new genre of, of card collecting. But I've done all kinds of stuff. Are you wearing the Elvis shirt? Because didn't your father also, there wasn't your father in the army with Elvis? My dad was the company clerk for Elvis. Uh, he was on shipboard with him when they went over to Germany. And there's this, the story of Elvis never performed while he was in service, which is really true, but not. On the shipboard going to Germany, there was a piano on one of the decks and Elvis sat down and played for five hours and sang. And my dad took two pictures of him and uh, I ended up donating, you know, both not the originals, but copies of the photos to Elvis Presley Enterprises because they had no photo of this at all. It didn't exist. Wow. Uh, but my dad, they, the first day there uh, in Freeburg, my dad went out on the first march. My dad's feet had blisters. My dad had flat feet. Well, that's the end of the marching. Go to clerical school. Up being the company clerk. So every day Elvis came in the office. How you doing, Danny? Can I get my pass? And my dad went and got the sergeant lieutenant to sign off, gave Elvis his pass. Then he went to his house. And my dad went to his house on Sundays and played touch football and had the spread and oh all that God. stuff. I mean, you both cool. you guys. I, I, I... I, I feel inferior to the two of you with, with the stories and the lives you guys have lived. And even, even Adam, man, like, like right out of college, didn't you work for uh, Stern? Yeah. Stern? I, I, so that was actually, I did. I was, in, I was, uh, I worked there for a year. I was at K-Rock and Sirius. I was an intern, but uh, it was really cool uh, to be there. Cause I'm a huge Stern fan and uh, it was really cool, but it was also really disappointing because I was there my senior year and I dedicated so much time to there. I was at the end of the K-Rock era and I was at the start of Sirius. So as a Stern fan, I was in paradise because I got to deal with all the whack packers and become close with them. And uh, again, as a huge, huge Stern fan and Artie's from the same town as I am. Um, but the unfortunate part, how that story ended was me not, long, soon as I, towards my end of my reign there, um, Sirius and XM merged and they weren't doing any hiring and I didn't get the job there, the full-time job. And that was like the knife in the heart and other people, that I knew that worked with got jobs and I didn't, uh, that was just like, fuck, what am I going to do now? And that was just, that was very tough. That was very difficult. So, but you know, uh, years later it kind of worked out and you know, I'm kind of glad that I'm not there cause I wouldn't be doing what I've been doing the last few years, you know, 10 years. And it's been good, man. You know, I can't really, I can't complain too much, but at that time it was very difficult. I did. I did Stern in 92 and Howard was great. Yeah. It was just great. What was your thing there? What did you do at Stern? What, you were just, just talking to you? and Well, yeah, I mean, I was on with another former child star and somebody I can't stand anymore. You would you'd love this. It's Corey Feldman. We were on I Stern knew it. Again. I knew you were going to say Corey Feldman. And, uh, you know, all Stern wanted to do was talk about the broads and what was going on. And all Feldman wanted to do was talk about his music. And Howard just kept laughing at him going, dude, it's crap. Would you stop already? You know? And this is yeah. back then, you know. Um, Scott, does he is he serious with the music? Yeah, it's a he, horror show. It, it, it's a it, horror it show. He, there's no self awareness. That's not music. Did, have you? So Sean, I, you can, I, can, I can do the music? greatest interview for Adam about this ever. <laughs> you want to know what the shit that goes down? I will tell you. I don't pull punches. We're Jersey oh. guys. We don't we don't sugarcoat this shit. He lives in fantasy land. He still thinks it's 1985 and he's the man and he's the star. And it's a joke, you know? I mean, you know, the money that he spends on these albums so nobody can listen to them. You know, it's just, you know, there's there's the, the CD of Corey Feldman singing and two cats fucking and I'll take the two cats fucking, okay? I mean, that's how bad it is. <laughs> it's kind of like Jeff stand-up. Anyway. <laughs> It would it wouldn't be a show without Sean doing a, a, a Jeff stand up joke. Um, I can tell you my TMZ. Can I tell you my TMZ story? Yeah. Okay. So my TMZ story is one time I flew into Buffalo and it was like an early flight and so I have a hoodie on. And I threw my sunglasses on. I'm walking to my rental car and somebody must have thought that like I was one of the bills because like I'm I'm six three three fifty like I'm a big dude. So they were just like pointing and stuff like that. So like I'm I'm like to fuck with people too. So I'm like, 
I should do this every flight. Like every flight that I get off, I should like try and be incognito as much as I can being 6'3", 350. So I'm flying into LAX and I'm like, all right, this is, I'm going to do it. I put the hoodie on. I put the fucking sunglasses on. I'm, I'm putting my head down. Got the, the iPhone hanging down. Nothing on so I can hear everybody saying. Somebody goes, Ralphie, Ralphie. I thought I was Ralphie, Ralphie May. May. <laughs> um, yeah. Wasn't that what that was the last time I ever did that. That's great. <laughs> yes. And I fly in LAX and nobody bothers me. Go figure. <laughs> great. So before we wrap this up, man, you know, we are a music show. <laughs> we we have spoke, we have spoke an iota of music. Um, who do you guys listen to? What kind what kind of music are you guys into? Adam? I'm into, you know, I listen to everything from pop to fucking rock country. I mean, there's not just whatever is like radio friendly. I mean, obviously I've been blasting Van Halen this week, but I, uh, I, I listen to everything. There's no, uh, there's no right or wrong with me. Um, um, yeah, I try to stay, try to stay hip with everything, but country I'm struggling with, but I appreciate it, but, uh, I, I'll, I, it's growing on me. But let's narrow you down to one band. If you had to say you had a band. I would say listen- this is. So that's a good. I would say my one band would probably be Dave Matthews Band, and the reason why I say that it's as a Jew who went to summer camp, it was the first band that I, uh, you know, there was like the Metallicas and all that stuff, but Dave Matthews Band was the first concert I ever went to, and where was that, it? It always stick with me. Do you remember where it was? Giant Stadium, two thousand one. Mm. Two thousand. So you were probably at the same show that I was when they had the huge lightning strike. It could have been actually. It could have been. I was so high, dude. I don't even know what was going on. It was rain. It was started to rain towards the end of the show. Actually, I, I do this, remember something like that. That's fine. Yeah, so it was like raining at the end of the show, and they were playing, I think, Ants Marching, if I'm not mistaken. And when they go people in yes! every direction, yes. it hits the drums, and lightning, sh- two bolts of lightning shot, like, directly in line from behind the drummer. And the, you heard the whole place go, holy shit! And then... <laughs> Like 70,000 people screaming at the same time. One of those things I'll never forget. Who opened that show? Oh, wow. Dude, I don't think I made it. But actually, it was someone good. I I, I remember being like, I remember being someone because they they used to have very good. Now they don't have openers, but they always had pretty good openers from like the Roots or someone it could have been. Um, It was was somebody good. I remember too. Yeah, Hmm. I forget. My first concert in 01 and I'm going, I was going to concerts in like 84. Oh, I was born eighty four. Well, you know what? My oh. first, my my the second concert I ever saw, second concert I ever saw, was it was the summertime of seventy eight. I was a kid. I was a, and I went to go see Black Sabbath because they were always my favorite band. Opening act on that tour was Van Halen, and they opened up with Eruption into You Really Got Me, and they basically did the first album. And you knew they were special from the moment you saw them. You, I've never seen an opening band like that. I've seen thousands of concerts. It was absolutely amazing. Scott, uh, who would you say um, first it, concert I mean, or music well, you love? Uh, first concert was Simon and Garfunkel in Central Park. Ah, wow. I was I was I was in the city for on a, uh, I think two auditions, and we got stuck late. And somebody said, oh, there's a thing going on in Central Park, Simon and Garfunkel. My dad was a Simon and Garfunkel fan. And I knew who they were, of course, and sang the song. Okay, fine, let's go. Um, Tough to say one band. I mean, you know, I mean, I had Journey and Bon Jovi and the Bee Gees and all that. But but if you said to me, you got to pick one band. One band, Desert Island, one band. The Beatles. The Beatles, greatest greatest songwriters ever to live. I mean... You know, and Adam, I, the piggyback. I'm, on I'm a let it be. Let it be is my favorite song of all time. It's, well, come on, no, no one's going to argue with that. Um, and to piggyback on something Adam said, I worked with McCartney for years, and I don't think there's a bigger star on the planet. I've met him several times and was in his hotel. The first time I ever saw a, a phone in a in a bathroom was in McCartney's hotel over at the um, at the Plaza Athene is where he used to stay. And, and he stayed there until uh, Linda passed and, and didn't uh, stay there anymore. Um, nicest guy, uh, you're right. The nice, I'll give you a great McCartney story, right? Um, McCartney came out with an album called Flowers in the Dirt. And when he did that album, he did a, a, a pop-up uh, press conference over at the Belasco Theater, uh, at the Broadway Theater. 
and, and uh, the guys I worked with who did uh, production, they were handling that. And they announced that he was also going to be doing uh, an impromptu concert. So I was in the city. I went down to see uh, my friends who were, who were running. I was like, hey, you know, any chance you can get me in? And he goes, come back at five o'clock. I come back at five. They're like, do you want to work? I'm like, yeah, I'll work. And I, I, was, I was dressed kind of like nice. And uh, they're like, why don't you do the VIP section? So I do the VIP section. I'm sitting next to Penny Marshall. And, uh, yeah, uh, yeah, Penny Marshall. I'm sitting next to Penny Marshall. In my section is Axel, Axel Rose, uh, Raquel Welch, um, Paul Schaefer, a couple of models. Um, okay, was sitting there. And all of a sudden, people started to come up the fire escape. And I, had to, I took about a half hour with a couple of other guys to clear the fire escape. Anyway, show's over. And we're doing a sweep, you know, getting people out of the, uh, out of the venue. My friend Fred Jarello, who right now to this day is Springsteen's road manager, uh, says, "Hey, do you want to come upstairs? You know, you know, until Paul leaves. I'm like, you know, you, you know, at least an, another extra hour. I'm like, I'll do it. I needed the money. I was like, I'm young. Okay, go up. We're there for about an hour and fifteen minutes, and all of a sudden McCartney comes out of the dressing room, and the first person he comes to is me, and he's like, "What's your name?" I told him who I was. He goes, "I just want to say thank you." I appreciate you sticking around a little bit later. Went over, introduced himself to my friend Fred, and then he brought his guests into the dressing room with, with him. And any time he was ever in New York, we were always requ requested to work uh, with him in his hotel because he wanted someone he can trust. I have, great, I, great I, guy. I, I just want to, I have one story, and it is like Eddie Van Halen week, you know, because he's, he's passed. This is several years ago. I'm at Claudia Wells from Back to the Future. She has a men's store in Studio City out here in California. And I'm in the, the dressing room, her little dressing room. It just has a kind of curtain that comes to the middle. And she's getting pants for me. So I'm standing there and I'm waiting for her to get pants. And I've got my head through the, the little middle, you know. And I see a guy walks by me. About a minute later, I'm still waiting for Claudia. The guy walks back, walks across me, stops and comes back. Looks down, looks up, dead looks me in the face and goes, dude, your dick is hanging out. <laughs> and I looked down, I got my underwear on and I looked up and he laughed and he walked out the door. It was Eddie Van Halen. Uh, <laughs> I think on that note, <laughs> guys, anything you'd like to plug? We'll, we'll start with Adam. Adam. Anything you'd like to plug? Gigs, anything, shows coming up? Um, you just follow me on at, at Adam Glenn on Instagram. You kind of keep me, uh, I keep posted with that. My Instagram story is kind of what's going on with me. I got a podcast called the Hollywood raw, uh, me and my partner Dax, who, uh, worked at TMZ with me kind of reveal the fourth wall of Hollywood, you know, kind of humanize Hollywood. We talk to editors about, and paparazzi about their stories and talk to celebrities. We've had people like, uh, people from Larry King to Brian Austin Green to, you know, just a bunch of random celebrities on to editors. So it's just kind of this cool podcast where we humanize Hollywood. It's called the Hollywood Raw Podcast. Check that out. That sounds really good. And, and Scott, man, we didn't even get to scratch the surface with some of the stuff you, uh, you've done and have going on. So what's going on with you? Anything you like to plug? Uh, I'm working on a pilot. My book will be out. We would have been out this year, but due to COVID and whatever, it'll be out next year. It's called Whatever Happened to Me. That's the name of the book. Uh, you can find me on social media, Scott Schwartz Actor, on Facebook. I don't really do the Instagram thing. I'm just too old for that shit, man. You know, whatever. But Adam, you ever want me to come on your show, dude? You let me know. I think I, I sent you. I think I sent your friends request on Facebook or whatever. Oh, perfect. But uh, you know, listen. I I just hope that everybody stays well and healthy, and you know, we all live good, and you know, just live, live and enjoy the life that we have. That's cool, man. And Sean, man, you got you added a couple of things. Where can people find you? Uh, Sean Morton Comic on Instagram. Sean Morton Comedy on Facebook. So we got Bananas Comedy Club November thirteenth and fourteenth in Hasbrook Heights. We got uh, Comedy Zone Harrisburg, Pennsylvania on November twentieth and twenty first. And uh, after that, my career is going nowhere. Um, but uh, thanks to our, for our, our talent coordinator, Mike Mastiello, for getting Scott on the show for us. Yeah, really. You know, this, this, this is the only music podcast where we spend an hour talking to people and we talk 45 seconds about them, <laughs> which is fantastic. So 
Uh, it's not always about music. Sometimes it's about having good guys on the show and just sharing some stories. These are two of the best. I mean, th- you guys really are were were amazing. We re- really do appreciate your time. It's you know, like oh, I we said, can come I, back. I, we I, can do this anytime, baby. We can do it anytime. Thank you, bro. We can do it anytime. <laughs> who was who was who, who? What impression are you doing? Who was that supposed to be? Is that Tom Jones? Really? Yes, I'm fucking. It's kind of like you. Jim Varney having a stroke. Thank you very much. I'd like to sing oh. a song for everybody. Thank you very much. Oh. Hello. I guess it's Elvis. Okay. Oh, was that Elvis? I thought I thought that was Elvis's brother, Bill. Bill Presley. <laughs> Bill Presley. Yeah. Sounded like Colonel Tom Parker right now. <laughs> well, I'll tell you what, Sean. Let's go on a stage and let's uh, sing a couple tunes, dude. I'm my a name singer. is my, my name is not Corey Feldman, so <laughs> bring it on. Nice. Corey Feldman. I can't. I still can't believe he thinks that's real. I think I think I always thought that was like a put on. That was just like a a, a gimmick, a a bit, like an Andy Kaufman esque bit. No, not at all. That's just pure ego. It, it's, it it's it's so delusional. I mean, we work in a business where people are delusional. Oh, that yeah. is beyond delusion. Well, we know that. Look at the world. <laughs> Look what's going on. Everybody got half the world delusional, and Hollywood is extremely delusional. Hmm. My favorite place I think in the Corey world. Corey Feldman sounds like he's at a different level, right? I say we get Corey Feldman on the show. That's what I say. Mike, make that happen. <laughs> Mike, oh, he'd probably Mike. do it so he can he can plug all of his crap that he's just trying to sell more more crap. You know? We got to have you on with Corey Feldman. No, I want to see Corey Feldman in a wrestling <laughs> ring. Oh, we can arrange that. Well, yeah. you go, you go. If you can get him there, I will be there with bells on. I don't want to get paid any money. Any monies that get paid, you can give it to Judy Haim, Corey Haim's mother. Well, trust I don't me, want to dime. You, you weren't getting any money from me, but Scott, All right, we could, let's Scott work on Schwartz that. Schwartz may be my favorite guest. I think so, no, too. He may be your favorite guest. <laughs> Adam's <laughs> definitely top 20, but Scott is definitely. <laughs> Scott in, is in the, the word, In the words of Stone Cold Steve Austin, there's a, there's a can of whip-ass coming, or The Rock. There's a can of whoop-ass coming. It's got Corey. Oh, this is going to make us go viral. We need a part two of this show, Sean. We finally got our viral moment. (laughs) I've made a joke for years. I said, especially with Adam being here, that's funny. I said, you see on TMZ, it says two former child stars have a fight. You don't have to read the fucking story. Trust me. You'll know who it is. And it's only going to be one winner. Everybody would think it would have been Danny Bonaduce. Danny's (laughs) a great guy. Listen, you know, there are many people that their egos or their their attitudes sometimes they get get in the way of themselves. Dustin Diamond is the same way. Dustin is hysterical, but his shtick just Man, goes nice too guy. far. And and Danny is the same way. Love Danny. I, you know, I just saw and I just saw Dustin this past weekend. You know. You know, Jeff. If you like, if I take my contacts out because I have a little glaucoma in this eye. And I didn't hear you. You kind of look like a dollar store version of Danny Bonaduce. Adam, where does he come up with this? <laughs> on that note. On that note is right. Um, this is my former co-host, uh, Sean Morton. And uh, <laughs> no, we, we, we really, really appreciate you guys' time. You guys were, were great, man. You guys are both great guys. And I you know, hope we hope to have you guys both on again sometime. That's, you guys we'll great. talk about Thank music this so time. Much. Let me yeah, know. Maybe we can talk about some music. Adam, I'll talk to you soon, hopefully, brother. Yeah, Scott, we'll Stay talk. well. Be well, guys. Thank you. I need a favor. Have a dirty water dog for me, okay? (laughs) Yeah, got you, brother. (laughs) Later, guys. We'll see you next week, everybody. Thanks, Adam, a lot.